Society 13 Podcast Network. Redefining Podcasts. Society-13.com I like to listen. History tells the story of the world and of our lives. Sometimes that history goes bump in the night. Broadcasting from the center of oddity and the supernatural in central Florida, it's the History Goes Bump podcast. Hello, you spooktacular people. Welcome to this 167th episode of the History Ghost Bump podcast. Ghost tours for the theater of the mind. I am your host, Diane. And this is Denise. On today's episode, we have a location that was suggested to us by Atticus Wolfgram, and it became the inspiration for us to look into more of these types of locations. Atticus had suggested the Portland Cement Works in Salt Lake City, Utah, And Denise, I managed to find two other ones, one in New Zealand and another one in Kansas, that are cement works with reputed hauntings. I learned a lot more than I ever wanted to know about cement. And guess what? The listeners are going to, too. Oh, well, that's fantastic. Just what we wanted to know. And I'm sure you have concrete evidence. (laughs) Oh, great. (laughs) I guess I set you up for that one, right? Yes, you did. Well, this is going to be fun because... We've done a lot of different places, but we haven't done a cement works yet. So looking forward to sharing these three different locations with you. Denise, I know a lot of our listeners are a little bit depressed. We're over Halloween. Now we're coming into Christmas. And you know, there's always those really good feelings about Christmas, which are great. But we're missing those Halloween feelings. So I thought it would be fun for us to do over on the blog, 25 Days of Creepy Christmas. Okay, that sounds... Wonderful, Diane. So I've been tweeting out links and putting them up in the Spectacular Crew and on our fan page. And if you can't get a hold of either one of those, all you have to do is go to historyghostbump.com, click on the blog tab, it'll take you over there. And we'll have for every day leading up to Christmas, something creepy that you can do that can inspire you to have maybe a little bit more of a spooky Christmas than necessarily a holly jolly one. Absolutely. It was funny because it reminds me of a conversation I had with my friend Lawrence yesterday. We were talking about holidays around the world at Epcot. And I'm like, yeah, it's really neat because it's the tradition of each country. And the figurehead of that tradition comes out and tells their story. He goes, as soon as they add Krampus, I'm there. (laughs) So we were talking about Krampus and like in some of the countries having different Krampuses. So it was it was quite fun. That would be fun, Krampus around the world. <laughs> or even if it was just like in America, because he goes, you know, we, we don't really have a lot in America. So he goes, we could put Krampus there. So he was very big <laughs> on the idea of adding Kr- Krampus to holidays around the world. Well, Italy does have a witch, so they're at least trying to get there. Except for that she does tell the most biblical story <laughs> out of all of the different characters over in the World Showcase. <laughs> Which made me giggle. But yeah. it's a lot of fun, no matter, no matter if Krampus is there or not. We want to welcome to the Spooktacular crew, Leaf. Hi, Leaf. Matt. Hello, Matt. Joanne. Hi, Joanne. Craig. Hey, Craig. And Emily. Hello, Emily. Denise, are you ready to go check out some of these Portland cement works? Yes, I am. History Goes Bump is entirely listener supported. Become an executive producer for as little as $1 a month. Get listed on the website and invited to exclusive virtual meetups. For $5 a month, you get that and access to exclusive bonus content like Haunted True Crime Bonus Cast. For $10 and above a month, you'll get all that plus awesome History Goes Bump gear. Check out patreon.com slash history goes bump or you can support us via PayPal. Click the support the show tab at historygoesbump.com for more information. (laughs) 
History is full of oddities, curiosities, mysteries, and the truly bizarre. Welcome to This Moment in Oddity. Iron Hill in Delaware was the scene of a conflict during the Revolutionary War. The Americans were situated at Welsh Track Church in Newark. A sentry was positioned at the outpost to keep watch at night. One night, the sentry got the scare of his life. A horse came charging at him, carrying a figure in white from head to toe. The sentry hid in fear until the phantom left. After he was relieved, he went to the head of command and begged to be moved to a different area. He said he would desert before he would face the phantom again. His request was granted. The next sentry was also scared by a rush of hooves. The horse was carrying a creature that was ghostly white. He tried to keep his wits about him and he raised his gun. He fired at the riding ghost. He was sure that he hit it with a bullet, but it only laughed mockingly at him. This continued for many nights with the rider visiting every night and every night the guard on duty would shoot without any effect. The Americans started calling the rider the Phantom Dragoon. The command was so fearful that they did not push forward against the British. An old American corporal was fed up with the stories about the Phantom. He was a true skeptic, and he took over guard duty to put a stop to the stories. He primed his musket and set himself up near the fence. Just after midnight, the beating of hooves started in the distance and approached quickly. The Phantom Dragoon looked like the pale figure of death riding towards him. He mustered his courage and took aim with his flintlock. The white form toppled from the horse and hit the ground hard. The corporal ran over as the horse sped off into the distance. He found a British scout lying on the ground, very dead. When he pulled away the white garments, he found that the scout was wearing steel armor, which had protected him from all the previous gunshots. The corporal had shot the scout in the head, which was unprotected. The British had used the superstitions of the Americans to keep them from pressing forward. The idea that a British soldier dressed to look like a ghost was able to fool the Americans and keep them from pressing forward certainly is odd. Are you afraid of the dark? <laughs> That's just silly. What you should be afraid of is the thing that watches you sleep. <laughs> This Day in History On this day, December 2nd in 1929, Chinese archaeologist and anthropologist Pei Weizong discovers the first Peking man skull on Dragonbone Hill in Jokodan of Fangsheng District in Beijing. It is believed that Peking man lived in the cave system of the upper part of Dragonbone Hill. The site was discovered in 1921, and several teeth and bone fragments were recovered, but nothing could definitively prove that this was a species. The discovery of the complete skull changed all of that, and it was decided that this came from Scynthropus pecanesis, a Beijing species of Chinese ape, popularly known as Peking man. The shape of the skull indicated that it belonged to a juvenile male around nine years old. Pei continued his explorations all the way into 1966, finding stoneware and other skull caps. In 1987, the Peking Man site was listed as a World Cultural Heritage Site, and its relics now receive world-class protection. You're listening to History Goes Bump! Portland cement is a material that helped build much of the world in the 1800s and still continues to be a major component of construction to this day. Early Portland cement works were unsafe places to work, as was the case with most fields of manufacturing. Dismemberment, burns, and death were a real concern. Three of these plants not only had injuries and deaths, but they are now reputedly haunted. Two are abandoned ruins, and another is a world-class haunted attraction today. We will explore the history and hauntings of the Portland Cement Works in Salt Lake City, Utah, Mahurangi Cement Works in Warkworth, New Zealand, and Kansas Portland Cement Works in Lahunt, Kansas. 
Portland cement was developed in the 18th century in Britain, and in 1824, an English stonemason from Leeds by the name of William Aspden obtained a patent on his mix that was a middle step towards Portland cement. What he had done is he had taken limestone and clay and burned them together. Denise, I had no idea how cement was made. I guess I just figured you mix this dry stuff with that dry stuff, and then, you know, we add water to it, and it solidifies, but you actually have to cook the mixture. So when you mix all this stuff, I had no idea. You got to put it in a kiln. So they would mix this limestone and clay together, ground it into a mix of powder, and then they would add water and sand to it. The result was similar to stone that was quarried over on the Isle of Portland in Dorset, England, and so that's where they got the name Portland Cement. So when I first read the suggestion, I went, oh, this must be a cement place in Portland, Oregon. That's what I was thinking as well. <laughs> and so see see how narrow our scope was? No, and it's not even close. So over in, and I didn't know there was an Isle of Portland, so I learned that as well. So it looks like the stone that's quarried from there. The basic ingredient in the cement is lime, of course, which comes from limestone. Again, we all know some of the theories when it comes to limestone. So if you think about how much stuff is being built with this, (laughs) it's a little nerve wracking. Then they generally mix it with shale, silicon, chromium, a bunch of other materials. It kind of depends upon the company, what they throw in there. As we're going to find out, there was a lot of blood mixed in with this as well. And then they came up with this powdery substance. Now, this is a very dangerous substance to make and use because it's caustic and it's a lung irritant. And we know the workplaces back in this time didn't realize that it's unsafe to do this. It's just like coal mining. They would all get black lung. And so in these cement works, I have a feeling they would get some kind of a lung too. I don't know that they had a specific name for it, but I I bet it caused them maybe similar to some of the asbestos stuff that we're seeing nowadays, probably had the same effect breathing all of these chemicals in every day when you're working in these factories. And again, it's caustic. So if you mix things a little wrong, you could have an explosion or something. This form of cement was a revolution in building. And the main reasons for that was because it was cheap to make and it was very versatile to use. The further development of Portland cement is a list of men from various countries throughout the 1800s claiming to have the patent on Portland cement. Isaac Charles Johnson of Britain would claim to be the father of this cement, and he is considered a pioneer in the industry. The United States imported the cement from Germany and England before developing its own plants, starting in Pennsylvania. David O. Saylor of Pennsylvania became the first producer of Portland cement in America, and he secured a patent in 1871. By the early 20th century, America was making its own cement and was no longer importing Portland cement. One of the plants in the United States was the Portland Cement Works in Salt Lake City, Utah. And what a creative name to call it the Portland Cement Works, Denise. (laughs) This is why when I put Portland Cement Works into Google, I got a bunch of them to pop up, and I was like, oh, okay. Quickly, I learned it's a type of cement, and then we get into all these different locations. Now, the Portland Cement Company of Utah was located on the 600 block and 800 south. So the streets in Salt Lake City must be a little different than what we're used to here in Florida. I never drove when I lived in Utah because we moved before I got my license. But I know everywhere you live is always by the numbers. And that will tell you exactly like where the house is if you know the system. And so I can't remember it exactly. Maybe one of our listeners who lived there can refresh the memory, but I know that it was always like 800 this and 600 that, and people would know exactly where you were. Gotcha. I know there's another city that we were in, and I can't remember, but remember the streets were all on a diagonal, so it was northwest and southwest instead Mm -hmm. of north, south, east, and west. Okay. Now, the reason why we said it was located on the 600 block is because we've seen a variety of addresses for this location. I saw 601, 611, 643, and today, the address that they have up on the building, which fits what it is currently, is 666. And they say it's 666 West, 900 South. So 900 and 800 South are kind of a block away from each other, but this was a big complex. So maybe that's why we're 900, it's on a certain area. It opened in 1890 in the Parley's Canyon in Salt Lake City. Initially, they were small and developed a weak product, but a bigger company, Lagu and Campbell, took over the holdings in 1893 and decided to use the same methods as the Pennsylvania Cement Works. So Pennsylvania was the first one to experiment with this. They found out how they were doing it and brought it over here to Salt Lake City. 
and by 1896, there were only two companies west of the Mississippi River that were producing Portland cement on a commercial scale. There was this plant in Utah, and then there was another one over in California. The manufacturing process took 80 steps and included using a rotary kiln to chemically combine the raw materials at Denise 3 thousand degrees Fahrenheit. Wow. Which is hotter than the temperature that is used to melt steel. That blew my mind because first of all, I didn't know they put this stuff in a kiln to mix it and then to think that they're using temperatures hotter than to melt steel. That is just, I mean, I, we all know about melting steel from 9-11. So it's just, wow, that is hot. But that makes you feel a little bit more comfortable when structures are made out of cement that it can probably withstand higher temperatures than steel. Very true. Who knew? (laughs) The compound was pounded to a fine powder and gypsum was added to regulate the time of hardening. In 1898, the plant caught fire and nearly burned to the ground. All that was left were brick walls, damaged machinery, and large smokestacks. So there you go, Denise. (laughs) Maybe they should have made the plant out of concrete. I don't know. You know, it just when I when I read it, it was like it nearly burned to the ground. And here's all that was left. And this is what the newspapers were saying. So it's like, wow. So either that was a really hot fire or I I don't know. And a fun fact about that, though, is that they were filling an order for the Denver Mint at the time of the fire. And for most people, they're probably like, so what? But we come from Denver and we've toured the Denver Mint, at least for myself, several times. So I thought that was a little fun thing that they were filling an order right at that moment when the fire broke out. The plant was rebuilt and later restored in 1910 to produce a capacity of 1,000 barrels of cement a day. Work in a cement factory was incredibly dangerous. Many workers lost their limbs or their lives in cement factories, and Utah's Portland Cement Works was no different. George Howe was one of these men. The coal crusher was a machine that had huge grinding gears and George was in charge of its operation. He worked the graveyard shift and one night he was oiling the gears. One of the gears hooked his shirt sleeve and began pulling him further into the machine. He screamed for help, but no one was there. His arm initially pulled free from the socket, but eventually George was pulled in completely and crushed. Not much was left of his body in the morning. Now, I don't know if maintenance... This graveyard shift, it was just him? Or if it was such a large complex that nobody heard him? Or how loud was the machine, maybe? I don't know, but you think he would be screaming pretty loud. That just, oh, I just, yuck. Yeah, I I can't even imagine what that would have been like. And I I don't even want to know how they figured out that his arm came out before he got crushed. I I just, whoever had to find that and clean it up, wow. Mm. Despite this first accident, no real precautions were put in place and the factory continued to be a place of dismemberment and death. Charles Whitner was another victim and he had only been at the cement works for two weeks. The steam from the vat caused him to become dizzy on an upper platform that was above the chemical boiler. Oh, geez. He experienced some kind of vertigo and lost his footing. He fell but managed to grab the lip of the vat. His hands were no match for the hot steel and he fell into the chemical concoction though before anybody could get over to him and help pull him up. Portland Cement Company of Utah was sold to Lone Star Industries in August of 1979, and they ran it until 1987 when they decided to shut down its Salt Lake City cement plant. The closure was supposed to be temporary, but eventually became permanent when conditions did not change. Not only was the work dangerous, but to keep costs low, cheaper fuels were used, and these included waste solvents, shredded tires, and other materials that may have contained toxic chemicals. This left behind contaminated dust. A Superfund cleanup was formed in the mid-1990s to clean up the site, and this was completed in 1999. It was still being monitored in 2014 to ensure that no toxic elements were still around. In 2011, the current owners acquired the property. They rebuilt and now host one of the most successful and one of the scariest haunted attractions in America, the Fear Factory Haunted House. The haunts they create are fake, But there are real spirits here. This is a haunted, haunted attraction. Now, when I first was looking into this, we got caught before when we did the mysterious episode, which I think was all the way back to episode eight. And this is another one of these really haunted, haunted attractions. But it was impossible for me to find the story that was the real story behind it because they'd made up a story to go with the house. 
Thankfully, this place has the real history on their site. And I applaud them for that and not making up something because really the truth behind this is terrifying enough. And I can only imagine, you know, I don't know if Atticus has been through here or anybody else in Salt Lake City. Have they kept some of the equipment there? This place has got to be creepy as heck. It's got underground tunnels and all kinds of stuff in there. So I can I can only imagine it's a great location to put a haunted attraction for sure. Well, you wouldn't even have to do the attraction to scare the pants off of me. No, and uh, you know, those usually I don't scare very easily, but haunted houses do tend to get me a bit. Especially when certain somebody's throw you at the chainsaw guy. Yeah, when Denise <laughs> throws me at the guy, I hate chainsaws. And I know they don't have the actual chain on that thing, but it just scares the crud out of me. And then Denise throws me at him and takes off. <laughs> well, apparently I don't like chainsaws either. <laughs> Take the girl, not me. The haunting experiences reported here by staff and guests of the haunted house include the distant screams of terror. These are not screams manufactured by the attraction as they're only heard when everything is quiet. So this is why it's mostly the staff that is hearing this before they get things geared up or after they've shut everything down. And, you know, they'll go and look. Is somebody still in there somewhere that's screaming about something? Nobody will be there. And it's... There are these weird kind of echoey, distant sounding screams, which, mm. you know, could this be George or Charles, either one of them screaming, especially George? If you think about how horrific that death would be and how we found that sometimes stone and things absorb that sound and energy. Well, especially if there was concrete there with limestone. Mm. I mean, you're going to have a lot of absorption if you believe in the properties of limestone. Exactly. So is this just a residual scream echoing through time? Shadow figures are seen looking down from upper levels. And then there's this interesting story that during the witching hour, it's claimed that a little girl and her laughing is heard. So she's seen and then her laughing is heard, although we have absolutely no records of any deaths of children at the factory and there shouldn't have been any children there. They didn't employ kids. So I'm not sure why we have that here. Ghost Adventures did come to this location and investigated the building. I didn't see that episode, so I'm not sure what they caught. I'm sure Zach ran around and heard a few things and yelled, did you hear that? Did you hear that? <laughs> so I'm sure they got something, but um, uh, sounds like a really, really neat location. I would like to, uh, maybe we could get a tour there if we go during the day with the lights on. That might work. <laughs> you know, I was just thinking of the little girl. I have two thoughts about that. Is it they say they didn't employ people, but back in the day, mm -hmm. a lot of times ch ch child labor was not uncommon to have them there at least doing some things. So that would be a possibility. And this might be going back to our old thoughts of what children, ghosts or hauntings might be, that that might be a trickster or maybe something of another nature, not necessarily a child. And you never know. Somebody might have had to bring their kid with them because... They didn't have anywhere to keep them. You just, you don't know. That's true. Or kids could have been playing around this area too. And something could have happened later because this was abandoned for a while. Good thought there as well. This is not the only haunted cement works in the world. New Zealand has the Mahurangi Cement Work located near Workworth. Workworth was originally a timber camp called Brown's Mill for a man named John Anderson Brown who built the sawmill there. Brown eventually changed the name to Workworth after Workworth in Northumberland. The Maharangi Cement Works is quite different from Utah Cement Works in that it sits in ruins today. But at one time, it was producing 20,320 tons per year. And you actually do say that is ton, even though it's spelled differently than how we spell ton? A ton is a metric ton that equals about 2,204 pounds. So that's a lot of cement. Yes, it is. Nathaniel Wilson had immigrated from Glasgow with his family when he was a child, and as an adult, he bought a parcel of land south of Workworth Village. There he set up a lime kiln in 1866. He produced roach lime, which was used in the making of plaster and mortar. In 1885, he began experimenting with Portland cement and opened Wilson Cement Works with his brothers. The roach lime had been an inferior product, but once Nathaniel started producing Portland cement, they were able to ship high-quality cement to Auckland. And this is right near the water there, so they had a little, I guess, a little mini port where they were able to bring in boats and ship it out. The cement was used in many building projects, including the Queen Street Sewer, Rangitoto Beacon, Grafton Bridge, and Queen's Wharf, the Rotorua's Bathhouse, and Napier's Breakwater. 
By 1903, the plan employed 180 workmen. The works was expanded with a large concrete building at that time. The Maharangi River was nearby, and that is where the cement works got the name it is known by today. The river is a tidal estuary in northern New Zealand. Success continued until 1918 when the New Zealand Portland Cement Company amalgamated with Maharangi. This company was located at Limestone Island, and the cement production was moved there. Maharangi then focused on hydrated lime, and it eventually closed in 1929. And just so people know, we were able to find some old photographs, and those are in the show notes. And then we have pictures of the ruins as well, so you can see where it originally was at and where it is today. So as we said, there's only a ruin left, but it has been registered under the Historic Places Act of 1980. It is a place important to industrial archaeology, and people come to visit for the history and to take cool pictures of the ruins, sitting next to a picturesque lake formed by the flooded quarry. It also serves as a testament to the first cement works in the southern hemisphere. But are the ruins completely abandoned? People who visit claim to see mysterious shadow figures amongst the ruins, and screams are heard here as well. Odd lights and ball orbs have been witnessed, and one of the stranger sounds people have heard is something like a generator running. So there you have some of the residual sounds again, and we didn't get any reports of people being hurt here, but I'm sure it was no different than the one in Salt Lake City. And with screams, again, probably people being caught in equipment or something like that. And people do visit quite often, not only to take pictures, but that flooded quarry lake that's there is a place that people like to go take a dip. So they actually use it as a watering hole. Returning to America, we find another abandoned and haunted Portland cement works in Kansas. As was the case with many of these cement plants, this was practically the sole provider of jobs in the small town of LaHunt. And when the plant shut down, the whole town was abandoned. So not only do we have an abandoned work site, but we have a ghost town, basically. The United Kansas Portland Cement Company built the cement works in 1905 on 1,500 acres on the side of Table Mound outside of Independence. Lee Hunt was the president of the Hunt Engineering Company of Michigan, and he supervised the building of the plant and helped design the company town around it, naming it after himself, Le Hunt. So, you know, no big ego there or anything. Well, it's funny that he didn't just call it Hunt. He wanted to make it sound, I guess, exotic. He goes, I'm Le Hunt. <laughs> I guess. My name is Lee. I'm going to call it Le. <laughs> Le Hunt. Le Hunt. It's French. Table Mound was rich in raw materials that could be used in the production of the Portland cement, and a quarry was located atop the mound. The material was transported via gravity, so they didn't have to build any special machinery to bring it down. I guess it was easier just to lower it somehow. The company town started with a couple hundred people, and a school, church, store, and bars were built. By 1906, the population was 1,000. Life in a company town was controlled since the company provided all the services and deducted fees from the workers' wages. A man named Tom Mix was brought in to be marshal of the town. This is the same Tom Mix that would go on to fame in silent movies. So the cowboy he played in movies was not far removed from in real life. Mix did a good job as marshal, but eventually he was run out of town on a wagon, literally. He was a womanizer and was caught with another man's wife. They loaded him in a wagon and took him outside the town limits and dumped him. And Tom Mix was married five times. So, yeah, he definitely liked the ladies. <laughs> Got him into a little bit of trouble there. But I thought, isn't that interesting that he played this cowboy in all these silent movies and was basically a cowboy hero. And he actually was really a marshal at one time. I had no idea, especially in this little bitty town. Everything was great at the plant before the Great Depression. But by 1911, things were going south and the decline was swift. The fuel they were using, natural gas, was depleted and railroad rates spiked. In 1913, the plant shut its doors. They reopened briefly in 1915, but soon World War I began and production became unprofitable. Bankruptcy followed in 1918, and the plant would never reopen. The school that they built there remained open until 1947. Not much remains of the abandoned town. The plant is in ruins and covered in graffiti, and there's a nearby cemetery. A few foundations still exist, as do sidewalks, and the school itself still stands. There is a cemetery about a half a mile down the road from the plant. Vandals have toppled headstones, but volunteers try to upkeep the grounds, although weeds do not grow much in the cemetery. And it's not necessarily because that the nutrients aren't all that good in the soil. They're they're not sure why a lot of brush doesn't grow in that cemetery. It should be overgrown. 
Well, of course, it's, it might be like those other places where we have things that don't grow on the ground, Spanish moss that doesn't show up in trees. So it might be a, a mm-hmm. spirited paranormal type thing. Could be. Five stones mark the graves of children. One person died in La Hunt in its 1905 to 1917 heyday, and that person's grave is here. There's also a large headstone for the Murphy family plot. That grave marker is more prominent because they donated the land for the cemetery. There is illegal dumping around the town and signs of partying left behind. There are claims that the abandoned site has been used for satanic rituals. As a matter of fact, that came up in a trial during the 90s after a teenager named Brian Durnell was brutally beaten and shot in the woods near the plant. Keon Hadley was convicted of the murder, although his lawyer argued that two teenage girls who were the main witnesses had actually been the killers. He claimed they were Satanists who used the abandoned cement works as a place to perform human and animal sacrifices. So I don't know if that's a carryover from the 80s satanic panic, but uh, I thought that was kind of interesting. There's a memorial to a Mexican laborer who was named Bors. It is three sections of wall dedicated to him near the crumbling smokestack. He was working on one of the 15-foot-high walls when he became pinned inside the wall while the concrete was being poured. He died, and the workers decided to leave his body in the wall since there was nothing that could be done for him. The first wall section contains his shovel and pickaxe. The second section has his wheelbarrow, and the third has his name sculpted into the wall. Now, because of this horrendous way of dying, and maybe because his objects and belongings have been left there in the concrete, and obviously the shovel and the pickaxe have lost their wood handles, so it's basically just the metal now sticking out of the concrete, but it's believed that his spirit is still here. Several people have claimed to see his ghost wandering the ruins. You know what's interesting about that, like, Back in the day, they used to actually, Aztecs and different indigenous peoples, they used to actually put people in when they were doing structures to have their spirit there as like a sacrifice. So it's kind of <laughs> great. They did. So this guy uh, was inadvertently sacrificed to the gods of concrete. Yep. Obviously, it didn't work because that place did not stay open very long. Yeah. So see, it doesn't work in America. It only works in other places. <laughs> Apparently so. Thank you for that uh, myth- mythological uh education to these. I don't know that it was mythology. I think it was actually ancient, more ancient history of our Aboriginal people. There are other hauntings in urban legends connected to the abandoned town. A ghost dog has been seen and heard rustling among the bushes and other wooded areas. Disembodied whispers are heard near the crumbling plant. Visitors feel a heaviness, particularly near the board's memorial. A full-bodied apparition of an elderly man has been seen walking the sidewalks at twilight. And I wonder if he is the only person that's buried there in the cemetery to have died in the town during its heyday. That would make the most sense to me. Yeah, so who knows, but uh, interesting place to check out. The cement works are remnants of an earlier time. Do these abandoned places hold more than just memories? Are the ruins haunted? Is the haunted attraction Fear Factory really haunted? That is for you to decide. Now, I know that La Hunt, this abandoned city, I believe the whole place is now behind a fence or chain link fence, something like that. So you can't go visit it anymore, at least is my understanding. Anytime you're wandering around any of these ruins, just be careful. And we didn't tell you to go. (laughs) Exactly. On our next episode, we are going to be bringing you a location that was suggested by Mitch, and that is the Sally House. This one has a heck of a reputation, so we're looking forward to bringing that to you guys. want to encourage you to check out our website, historygoesbump.com. And Denise, if people want to send us some feedback, where can they do that? They can do that at historygoesbump at gmail.com. And we did hear from Jan, who lives in Oahu. Yay, Oahu. Aloha, Jan. (laughs) Aloha. We just went and saw Moana, so we're kind of in that frame of mind. Good movie. We highly recommend it. Yes. And we'll send out a shout out to Moana as well. Talofa. That's Samoan. Nancy Cowie said she's a little bit more Samoan. Oh, okay. (laughs) Gotcha. (laughs) I'm like, whatever she said. She's like, yeah, the loafa for my what? I am kind of hungry. We're going to eat a loafa what? I came across your podcast earlier this month while searching for new podcasts to listen to while on my drives to and during work. I'm binge listening to the podcast right now, and I'm currently listening to Bonus Cast 3, Ghosts in the Bible. 
She said that one is her favorite so far. And we've heard a lot of feedback on that one. I feel almost like we should do a Ghosts in the Bible part two. That would be fun. I don't know where we'd go with it, but it just feels like we should. I just wanted to let you both know that I love the energy you both have and share with us listeners. I love History and the Paranormal, so your podcast is the best blend of the two. I learn something new after every episode, and I'm so grateful for the new knowledge that I'll be able to randomly share with my family and friends. Now you'll be able to tell them, Jen, how to make cement. Isn't that great? (laughs) Yeah, she'll be like, woohoo, and it's very, very dangerous. And then she just thanked us for the uh, time and research that we put into everything to make sure that we're getting the most accurate information. And of course, if we screw up somewhere, you guys let us know, and we quickly correct that with everybody. So thanks for sending that to us, Jan. And Bela sent us a message. She said, Hi, History Goes Bump. I love your podcast. Just finished the Molly Brown one, and I have some thoughts to share with you. I was born and bred fourth-generation Denverite in Denver, and my husband and I bought and renovated a gorgeous historic four-square house not far from the Brown Mansion, which is what brought that to mind for her. And I had written her back and told her that I know this neighborhood very well because once upon a time I used to deliver pizzas for, and for those of you in Colorado, I don't even know if they're still around, Pudge Brothers Pizza. They were yummy. It was good Good pizza. pizza. (laughs) So I used to deliver right in this neighborhood. And she said that her husband was a very skeptical person after living in this house uh, and not so skeptical anymore. And so she said that she thought that this had been a house that was built for a doctor and that at one point it was a sanitarium. And it's also a location that they stop by when they have the ghost tour in the Cheeseman Park area. Well, this happens to be a location that my mom has written a book about that we have done tours with. And we've been tossing around doing Cheeseman Park, but it's not really big enough for us to have that as just its own episode. But doing the whole neighborhood and pulling out a bunch of houses there would be really cool. That so I would have a be feeling we're going to be doing that. That'd be very cool. And for those, I don't know if we've ever mentioned it on the podcast before. We possibly have, but if anybody ever saw the movie The Changeling, that house was inspired by a real haunting at Cheeseman Park. It was a house that was right mm-hmm. there, and it, it's no longer there anymore. It did get torn down. And there's the Denver Botanic Gardens there, which is incredibly haunted. The reason why all of these places that are near Cheeseman Park are so haunted is it's very similar to St. Charles or New Orleans. A lot of cemeteries that got built over. (laughs) So that's part of the problem that's happening there. So thanks so much for sharing that with us. And when we get into that, we will definitely have her share her personal experiences of living in a haunted house. And this makes me think about Benjamin over in the Spooktacular crew was sharing that Somebody had asked, what paranormal shows do you all watch? And he said, I don't need to watch one. I live in a haunted house. We're like, yikes. He just watches his own ghosties. For us, me in particular, I watch all of them just because it feels like you should when you work in this kind of genre and you should see what's out there and see what kind of history they're picking up. And Kindred Spirits, I have to say, I've I've enjoyed that one. It's, of course, there's the music and the, oh my gosh, and shock factors and things. But I just feel like they really are trying to help people rather than just have an entertaining show that they're going to these locations that are not big popular ones. It's personal homes and trying to help people feel a little bit better about what's maybe in the house with them. So I've been enjoying that. All right. We don't have any reviews. So you guys, if you haven't given us a review, we'd love to have one, especially if you are from another country. We haven't had an international review for quite some time. So we would love to have one. And if you're from somewhere other than the major four, which would basically be Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom, let us know that you put it up there so that we are able to find it and know that you've done that. Actually, I've got an international challenge. Let's get a review from every one of those places you just said. That would be fun. Yeah, we'd love to get one from those ones. And uh, we have people listening in places that I would have never even imagined. So if you are listening via iTunes, we'd love to have your review. I want to thank you guys for tuning into this episode. I have been your host, Diane. And this has been Denise. You take care now. Bye-bye. This episode has been brought to you by our executive producers. We'd like to welcome new executive producers, Bella Patiasina and Shannon Corsi. Thanks. Have a spooky experience that occurred at an historic location? Want to give us feedback or have a suggestion for the show? Share it with us at historygoesbump at gmail.com.